Yep. Can everybody hear me? Am I loud enough? Can you hear me no. back there? No, turn no, it up. No, turn it up. Some are saying louder. How about now? Is that better? A little better, maybe a little louder? Yes. Thank you, Lord. How about now? Can you hear me? Is that better? Mm -hmm. okay. A little bit more. It doesn't sound different to me. But no, it so maybe to me a little either. bit. A little yeah. bit more. <laughs> I can talk louder too. There you go. There we go. Okay, I'll talk loud. It's not not my nature to talk too loud, but <laughs> I'll talk louder for you. The title of today's message is "All or Nothing." All or nothing. Let's uh, turn to Matthew five, starting with. Verse 1, I'm going to read 1 through 10. Wait till everybody gets there. Thank you, Lord. The B attitudes. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on the mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Thank you, Lord. I just want to, to open this message with, a, with praying. Thank you, Lord. We just thank you and praise you for what you have in store for us, Lord. Give us ears to hear and a heart that's just open to receive all that you have for us, Lord. I thank you and praise you for your will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And this day, Lord, this day, your will be done in each of our hearts and our minds and our bodies. And we thank you and praise you that we are a blessed people. We are so very blessed. And that each one of us will, will just grab onto that and feel it and know it and live it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 When I sought and prayed to the Lord for today's mes message, he impressed upon me this idea of purity. And verse 8 in the scriptures that I just read is where my initial search for the word led me. I'm just going to read verse 8 again. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And I think now more than ever, we need to hear about remaining pure in heart. In a time when there are so many distractions, so many lying voices and false teachings, out there today in our world as we know there always have been but it seems like it's escalated in recent days as we believe these are the end times we're living in so we need to, to hear about this this message of remaining pure pure in heart else we fall prey to the tactics of the enemy and his aim to steal kill and destroy he wants to render the church useless God wants us to draw closer to him than ever before because he wins. Amen. 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 He wins. Amen. Hallelujah. So do we. And so do we. <laughs> I'll delve into this idea of purity and blessing that comes from it, of seeing God, in a bit. But first I wanted to spend some time talking about what beatitude means. Beatitude is actually a Latin word that is derived from the Hebrew word blessed, or the Hebrew word, which is blessed, is also esher. Esher means to be happy, to advance, to make progress, to go forward, be led on, relieve. Happy is the one who walks a straight path. So in these scriptures, that's what the word blessed means. And then when I did a little word study for what that word, for that word, blessed, or esher, it led me to the word blessed, which is translated esher, or beatitude, found in Psalm 32, 1 and 2. So I'm going to turn there, you want to turn with me, Psalm 32. Psalm 
This word blessed here is the same word as being used in the Beatitude. Psalm 32, starting with verse 1. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. And in the helps, it says the Apostle Paul used these verses to describe the happy state of the man whose sin is forgiven by the grace of God, not by struggling to keep the works of the law. Transgression means rebellion, sin is missing the mark, iniquity is moral depravity, and there is also deceit. Sins are forgiven, literally lifted away, covered, and not imputed, literally, or literally erased from the record. So that the spirit of man is totally righteous in God's eyes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And then I'm going to read another section, section of the Bible, Psalm 33, 12, where that same word is used. And it's just a page over, Psalm 33, verse 12, says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. Hallelujah. And down in the helps, it says, The people who have such a sense of security by knowing that the creator of the universe, the sovereign over nations, has specifically chosen them as his very own people can be called no less, no less than blessed. Hallelujah. Blessed is the United States of America, Amen. whose God is the Lord. Amen. We declare it and we decree it. Yes. In Jesus' name. Yes, thank you, Lord. God has a plan for the United States. Yes, thank you, Lord. And I want to turn to page or to Psalm 65 for just read one more passage of scriptures that talk that use that word blessed. <coughs> and it's 65 4. Blessed is the man you choose. Who chooses? God chooses. Blessed is the man you choose and cause to approach you, that he may dwell in your courts. He shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, of your holy temple. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Blessed is the man you choose and cause to approach you. Hallelujah. I want to approach God. I should have told you to help hold your place in that Matthew 5 scripture because I want to go back there. The be attitudes. Matthew 5. 1 through 10. I'm going to read the helps there for those. For 5-3. Uh, it says each be attitude includes a pronouncement of blessing, a description of the ones considered as blessed, and an explanation for the blessing. The poor in spirit, which is the very first one, are those who have who recognize their spiritual poverty and casting aside all self-dependence, seek God's grace. Hallelujah. When we recognize, and we all have at times, and I say at times because we lose sight of it from time to time and need to remind ourselves of just how blessed we are. I want to read the definition for blessed in my Spirit-Filled Life Bible just below the Beatitudes if you have it. It says, it's indicating large or of long duration. That's a blessing. We're blessed for long duration. The word is an adjective suggesting, oops, the word is an adjective suggesting happy, supremely blessed, a condition in which congratulations are in order. It is a grace word that expresses the special joys and satisfaction granted the person who experiences salvation. Who here has experienced salvation? Yay. Congratulations! 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 Turn to your neighbor and say, Congratulations! Congratulations! That is the most exciting news ever. 
We say congratulations to people for many things, right? Yeah. Congratulations on, a, on your marriage. Congratulations on the birth of your baby. Congratulations on the promotion. Congratulations on graduating college. And those are very good times to get congratulations. But salvation is the greatest yeah. occasion yeah. worthy of expressed heartfelt congratulations. Yeah. So congratulations. Thank congratulations. You. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Hallelujah. There's not a single event that could ever hold a light to what our Lord has done for us. Amen. Amen. And when we keep that truth and the recognition of the impact that has on our lives daily in the forefront of our thinking, the attitude that we want to be, be attitude, to remain happy and feel supreme, supremely blessed, that sense of security won't be shaken by any of the circumstances of life. An attitude of praise and thanksgiving can't help but erupt when we keep that perspective, God's perspective. I've spent some time lately meditating on the idea of attitude. Jeremy and I have had some conversations about attitude as it pertains to our six-year-old. He has held on to a teaching from Bill Johnson that he did a while back, we listened to, where he talked about disciplining the attitude before it turns into a behavior. So we've really tried to do that. And you talked about the Lord giving us strategies. The Lord gave us that strategy. Once we see a wrong attitude forming, we try to nip it in the bud before it turns into a behavior. And how can we tell when it's happening? It's very clear with Gemma when it's happening. There is a look on her face. There's a, t a tone in her voice. <laughs> it's very telling. But it caused me to really look at my own attitudes and realize the importance of having a good attitude and how it's important for my own affect and how detrimental a bad attitude is to my happiness, to that supreme happiness that we just talked about. Knowing that happiness, and not just your average happiness, supreme happiness, the truest form, comes from recognizing who God is and just what he's done for us. An attitude that is influ influenced by that alone is the key to the peace that surpasses all understanding and joy unspeakable and overcoming victory in our own lives because it stops fear and doubt and any other thing that looks to exalt itself above the knowledge of God right in its tracks. It doesn't feel good to have a bad attitude, does it? No. You feel like there's angst within. There's an angst. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was looking at the word attitude, and I found, as you, as you have well known me over the time of my ministering, I like to look up words and their meaning. It just brings it all together for me sometimes. And I found an explanation of the word attitude. Actually, it, it was written by a psychology review or um, article. And it lists three components. When um, And the three components are, number one, an affective component. So our feelings. My feelings influence my attitude. Right? And we know we, we shouldn't go by our feelings. A behavioral component. Unless our feelings are, are good, I should, I should say. A behavioral component. The effect of attitude on behavior. And even though some of us have gotten a little bit better than my six-year-old at hiding a bad attitude, it will likely end up coming out in a wrong behavior if we don't nip it in the bud before that. And three, a cognitive component. That's belief and knowledge. So for a negative attitude, this piece is influenced by structures in our mind that come from believing lies and wrong having wrong opinions and beliefs. Things we have taken on and have infected our heart, things from childhood maybe, things we were taught, lies the enemy slings at us, at ourselves and the world around us, opinions we've formed based on our own ideas and agendas. 
And I'm going to read you a quote from that article. Psychologist Leon Festinger, 1957, defined cognitive dissonance as psychological discomfort arising from holding two or more inconsistent attitudes, behaviors, or conditions. That's thoughts, beliefs, or opinions. Festinger, Festinger's theory of cognitive dissonance states that when we experience a conflict in our behaviors, attitudes, or beliefs that runs counter to our positive self-perceptions, we experience psychological discomfort or dissonance. For example, if you believe smoking is bad for your health, but you continue to smoke, you experience conflict between the, your belief and your behavior. What does that sound like to you? That is double-mindedness, right? Yeah. That is double-mindedness. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And the rest of that Proverbs 23, 7 that I just quoted, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he, says, eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. The thoughts and inclinations of the heart shape the reality of who you are. They shape your thinking, which will ultimately shape your actions. And I'm going to look at Matthew 15, 8. Let's turn there. says, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And I'm going to read the King of Dynamics there. It says, Jesus quotes from Isaiah 29, 13, and charging the Pharisees with settling, setting, sorry, aside God's word by their traditions. Jesus dismisses their worship because their hearts were not aligned with their lips. Living faith, true worship, requires that the mouth and the heart be together to avoid Jesus' charge of hypocrisy. Praises and true faith emanate from lips that draw from the depths of the heart. As a living principle, faith's confession is not a ritual recitation of slogans, otherwise it is only acting out a human tradition and as Jesus notes, is potentially hypocritical. Just as we are called to genuine praise and worship, not as pretenders or ritual performers, so let our confessing of God's promises be without hypocrisy. Let us speak what God's Holy Spirit has truly birthed in our hearts, thereby bringing us to faithfully speak with our lips. And you know, that really just struck me more than ever before, because and I hope others can, can, um, can recognize this maybe in times in your life as well. That sometimes, and not always, and thank goodness not today and many times recently, uh, sometimes during praise and worship, my mind is wandering somewhere else. But I'm still singing. And I have to get myself back. Or else this is, this is that's called hypocrisy. And that's scary. That's actually really scary. We should, we should really recognize that when it's happening because it's so important to remain true and aligned with your heart and your lips. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Which leads me to the verse, blessed are the pure in heart. Hmm. I'm going to read the definition of pure. If you turn back to that passage of scriptures, if you have... That definition in your Bible, where the Beatitudes are, of pure. I'm going to read it. Thank you, Lord. Pure, without blemish, clean, undefiled, pure. The word describes physical cleanliness, ceremonial purity, and ethical purity. Sin pollutes and defiles, but the blood of Jesus washes the stains away. Now I want to look at the word heart, and I'm going to turn to page 714 and read the definition of heart. And I know I've read it before because I had a lot of stuff written there. <laughs> and it's for the scripture, Psalm 37, 4. And I'm going to read the scripture as well. 
Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Heart is this, intellect, awareness, mind, inner persons, inner feelings, deepest thoughts, inner self. As in English, the Hebrew concept of heart encompasses both the physical organ and a person's inner yearnings. Perhaps the noblest occurrence is Deuteronomy 6.5, commanding Israel to love the Lord with all your heart. And Jesus laid great emphasis on this sentence in Mark 12. Jeremiah 17.9 states that the human heart can be the most deceitful thing in the world. But verse 10 shows that the Lord is still able to sort out and analyze, and analyze what lies within the heart. Thank you, Lord, for sorting out what lies in my heart. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Purify my heart. So that's the in entire inner person. What's going on inside? And the only other person who knows what's going inside of me and you is God, right? Man looks on the outer, God looks on the inner. He looks on the heart. We all have things that go on in our head and in our heart that we would probably be mortified if it was all up there on the screen in front of, for all to see. Our inner thoughts, attitudes, issues, opinions, anger, fear, unbelief, discouragement, resentments, emotions, pride, whatever it may be. I'm, 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 am I alone in that? Is anybody else here? Thank you. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, Lord. I meditated a lot on the idea of purity. And I kept in mind that when we believed in our heart and confessed Jesus as Lord, with our mouth we were made pure and holy instantaneously. That is, we were instantly set apart. We came into right standing with Father God. What this and other similar scriptures are saying is because we were made pure and holy, set apart by the atoning work of the cross, we are to live like it. <clears throat> to gain access to the throne room, to see God, to see his hand move on our behalf, he wants to purify our hearts. It's an ongoing process. Meaning we are not to allow contamination or double-mindedness and sin to come in, no impurities. Because when we do, there is this inherent inner conflict, as I talked about in that psychological description of dissonance. Our spirit and our flesh warring. That's the inner con conflict. We can't serve two masters. How do we attain such purity? It sounds impossible to do in our own strength. Guess what? It is. It is impossible. And Pastor talked this morning, I added this piece of it um, in prayer time about restoration. And she talked about it last week, restoration. The visible picture of our highway, Route 100, being res restored. It's a simultaneous tearing down and building up at the same time. In our own lives, these wrong constructs, thoughts, feelings need to be torn down and built back up simultaneously. All impurities need to be removed. Yes, thank you, Lord. That's restoration. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And he's coming back for a spotless overcoming bride. Yes, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. In and of ourselves, many of us can modify some of our own behaviors, right? We can, we can, we can do that. We can choose to, to uh, abstain from certain behaviors or, um, you know, even... To, and that's that idea of self-discipline. And even possible, to a certain degree, to um, change some of our thoughts, right? Some of our thought processes. We can do that in and of ourselves, to a degree. Just for ourselves. Yes, definitely more so. But what about when something hard happens? What happens when we slam our finger with a hammer? Or how about this one, which I think some here will be able to re relate to. What if we're struggling with something, sometimes simple things, that like a non-cooperative computer? I mean, how frustrating is it to be on the computer and not be able to have it do what you want it to do? Yeah. <laughs> then we have to go on our own <laughs> a car that pulls out in front of you, 
And then this one, I, I saw somebody, I heard somebody say this, and it's, but it's so true for me, I, mothers might be able to relate. You're in a hurry, you're really in a hurry, you wanna get somewhere, and you catch your shirt or your sleeve on the railing of the stairs as you're going downstairs. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> Or you're, you're getting up in the middle of the night because you want just want a simple drink of water and you drop the glass of water on the floor and, sh and it breaks. We do just fine with our behavior modification when things are going well. But the instant something hard or frustrating or irritating happens, it goes out the door. We need more than self-help. We need more than self-discipline. And what about bigger stuff? When the big storms of life come, how do we navigate or respond when our faith is tested? The money doesn't come in. The healing doesn't come right away. The prodigal son hasn't come home yet. It's in these moments that what is in our heart will be revealed. I'm going to look at Matthew 23. Starting with verse 25. 25 and 26. Huh. Thank you, Lord. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Wow. You know, when I was studying for this message, this stuff... It, I mean, I was taking it very seriously because I need to hear it, but as I'm saying it, I feel like I'm being mean to you. <laughs> no, you are. Praise God. Yeah. Praise God. But I need to hear this. Yeah. I need to hear it. Thank you, Lord. Down in the house, it says, they paid detailed attention to matters pertaining to ceremonial cleansing while ignoring God's demand for inner holiness. So important. Mm -hmm. So key for us as believers as the remnant, as his end time church. So important. The solution is this. It's really a simple concept. Purity of heart comes from spending time with Jesus. Yeah. It's not something we can do ourselves. Yes, we may be able to do a little behavior modification. But we, we always have choices. Continually we have choices to make. True, true purity of the stuff that's on the inside, deep inside, the heart, the thoughts, the inner, that comes from time spent with him. And the more time you spend with him, the easier it is to make the right choices. And the inside and the outside will align more and more often. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Which is Amen. in alignment with God. So that what he thinks, we think. What he says, we said. What he prays, we pray. Perfect oneness, perfect alignment. Hallelujah. When we spend time with him, that is a natural byproduct. The two come aligned. Our inside and our outside. Our actions, what we do, come aligned. Hallelujah. Keeping an attitude of gratitude. Remember that blessed, we're blessed. Keeping that attitude comes from having singleness of mind, single, singleness of purpose, singleness of eye, solely focused on one thing, God. External forces contaminate, we know that. Those things we are to be separate from. That's worldliness, anything that's contrary to the word of God, that's contrary to his nature or the truth. A little leaven spoils the whole lump. The only way to remain pure or uncontaminated by all that stuff is by remaining in close proximity to the King of Kings. And we desire that closeness when we have that be attitude, which is blessing or happiness, supreme happiness, oh. from the knowledge of the astonishing, breathtaking, indescribable, overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God for his children, for you and for me. If we can transition our focus to that, when life circumstances want to rob our focus, 
or when feelings and emotions want to rule our hearts and our thoughts, we won't stay there for long, if at all. If at all. I want to look at another definition of the word pure. It's in 2 Peter 3.1. What is that? Second Peter three one. I'll read the scripture and then I'll read the definition. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. That's what we need to do. Be reminded constantly. Pure, literally tested by sunlight. The thought is that of judging something by sunlight to expose any flaws. The word described, described metals and alloys and liquids unadulterated with foreign substances. In the New Testament, it is used in an ethical and moral sense, free from falsehood, pure, and without hidden motives. And down in the helps, it tells me to go over to the truth in action on the next page. If you have that, I'm going to read the truth in action, truth number two. Cultivating Dynamic Devotion. The book of 2 Peter warns against false teachers and false doctrines. Two primary ways we are to fortify ourselves against such deception are to know Jesus and to know the Bible. Knowing the truth and recognizing the authentic will help equip us to recognize the false. And I, I, I stop there for a minute because that is so important for today, isn't it? Yes. Help us recognize the false. Because there are so many voices out there. There are, are literal organizations that sound and look good. Their slogans look good. But their evil agenda that's hidden in plain sight is, is, is evil to the core. Mm -hmm. Satanic. Mm -hmm. So when, as, as spirit-filled Christians, when we remain close to God, we, we develop a discernment for those kind of things. And what we can do is we ask ourselves, what is the fruit? What is the fruit I'm seeing from this? It looks good, it sounds good, but where's the fruit? What's coming out of this? What are they saying behind the scenes? What is, what is happening? And, and using that discernment, that comes from that oneness with God. And I'm going to just continue to read the rest of that. It is imperative then that we make our relationship with the Lord our highest priority. Begin reading and studying the Bible. Spend time with the Lord. Talk with Him. Share your heart with Him. And get to know Him intimately. He loves you and longs to spend time with you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And then in the next section, number three, I just underlined this sentence because it goes along with what I just said. Holy living, as purifying our hearts, then is a safeguard against false teachers. By it, we will be able to quickly discern who they are by the fruit of unrighteousness in their lives. Hallelujah. Thank you for that discernment, Lord. Amen. Purity is then not obtained through our own efforts. Though we do have a part in it. We are pure because of him. He did it, but we need to maintain it. Oswald Chambers says, purity is not innocence. It is much more than that. Purity is the result of continued spiritual harmony with God. We have to grow in purity, and that harmony and growth in purity comes from us doing something. That's our part, and that's spending time with Him, delighting ourselves in Him, obeying His word. Spiritual harmony with God. It remind, this morning when we were singing the song, Lord, play me an instrument and play us a harmony. Perfect harmony, because that, that oneness with God, when we're in harmony with him, our hearts are purified. Bill Johnson gave this great example in one of his teachings of Zacchaeus. And we all know about Zacchaeus. Climbed the sycamore tree for the Lord was passing by. Always reminds me of the song. In a message I listened to uh, he, recently, he said Zacchaeus climbed a tree just to see the Lord pass by and then spent time with Jesus. When Jesus invited him down and they went to Zacchaeus' house, after spending time with him, and I don't know how much time he spent with him, he vowed to give 50% of his earnings to the poor. 
and that he would pay back four times to anyone he cheated out of anything. And he changed his wrong ways. And this is the point that Bill Johnson was making. When you spend time with Jesus, his nature rubs off on you. It can't not. Right. That's probably not grammatically correct. I don't, I don't know. But it doesn't mean you know, know what I mean, right? It doesn't matter. Another Bill Johnson nugget. When you draw near to Jesus, part of who he is becomes part of who you are. It's that closeness that changes us. Amen. Hallelujah. That's a power nugget. Now I'm going to look at the third definition of pure in our Bible, and that's found at 1 John 3.3. 3. 1 John. All right, so I'm going to start with verse 1. <clears throat> Behold what manner of love... I'm going to read the scriptures and then the definition. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. Hallelujah. When we have that hope in us, we purify ourselves because we have that, that knowledge of what he's done for us at the forefront of our mind. We want to purify ourselves. The adjective describes a person or thing as clean, modest, pure, undefiled, morally faultless, and without blemish. Christ's ability to overcome temptation and remain pure makes him a role model for all believers. And down in the house it says, John expresses astonishment at God's love in regenerating believers, an experience the world cannot understand. The prospect of being transformed into the likeness of Christ motivates Christians to live righteously. I heard recently someone saying this, and I, I almost want to say that it was you, Pastor Heidi, when you were talking about a book that you're reading on Wednesday night, this past Wednesday night. I think it was you that said this, but I could be wrong, that throughout our day, you were reading about shifting your focus to God throughout your day. So no matter what you're doing, no matter what we're doing, because it's so easy to get distracted by the busyness of life, but it is possible to spend our day with him simply by shifting our focus and our thoughts to him. Just in any instant, you're doing something, you can still be doing that thing and shift our focus yeah. to God. And, and here's another thing from Bill Johnson, another quote. The strength of your heart is measured by what it takes to distract your praise. Sometimes when he says those things, I have to think about it for a minute. Can you repeat the strength of your heart is measured by what it takes to distract your praise. In other words, how distractible are you when you're focusing on God? That's how strong your heart is. Wow. Here's another. Spend your day with him before you spend your day for him. Another one. Whoa. It's you, doesn't it? Let that sink in for a moment. When you wake up, turn your affection toward him immediately. Throughout the busy busyness of your day, turn your affections toward him. When you lay your head on your pillow at night, turn your affections toward him. Yeah. Affection means a fondness that consumes you. Tenderness. If we remember his great unwavering love for us, this is an easy place to get to. I'm going to look at Psalm 63. How are we doing? I don't have any idea what time it is. We did a lot beforehand. I hope you're all still with me. This is not a 19-page message. Psalm it's what? Three o'clock. Like it. <laughs> Psalm, <laughs> wow, Psalm, time flies when you're having fun. Psalm what? Uh, Psalm 63. This is not one of my 19-page messages. It's only 10, so mm. hopefully we'll... Uh, it's only 10. Okay. Psalm 63. 
O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Show your power, Lord, because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise you. Your loving kindness is better than life. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches, because you have been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. Hallelujah. But those who seek Oh, I'm not going to go from there. I'm actually going to stop at verse 8. My soul follows close behind you. Another translation of that says, my soul clings to you. Yeah. Clings to you. There's this song that kept coming to my mind as I was, um, you know, studying for this message. And some of you may have heard it. It's called Endless Alleluia by Corey Asbury. Asbury. And I'm just going to read you the verses of the song. It's a very powerful song. And I just weep when I... When I listen to it, <clears throat> I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> in the morning when I rise to meet you, in the morning when I lift my eyes, you're the only one I want to cling to. You're the first thought on my mind. Let our voices rise, all creation cries, singing out an endless alleluia. From this moment on, join with heaven's song, singing out an endless alleluia. And that's the chorus. In the moments where you go unnoticed, in the ordinary day-to-day, -day, countless miracles of life around us point like arrows to your name. Only a moment to live this life, like shooting stars burning up the night, till heavens open and we arrive in your presence, Lord, in your presence. In the evening when I lay my head down, in the evening when I close my eyes, you're still the only one I want to cling to. You're the last thought on my mind. There's nothing better. There's nothing better. Mm -hmm. How are we spending our time? What are we meditating on? That idea of meditation or meditating has been perverted by the world. Oftentimes when the world is talking about med meditation, it's talking about emptying your mind, which we know is very dangerous. We don't want to empty our mind because what's going to come in when I empty it? But it is scriptural to meditate on God and the Word. We all know how to meditate. And if you don't think you do, think about this. This is a very good example of this. Having, it also having to do with laying your head on the pillow, like the, the song I just sang, or read. I don't know about you, but this is often the time I find myself meditating the most. However, it isn't always on things of God. Have you ever laid awake at night and played a scenario over and over in your head from something that happened in the day or something you're preparing for for the next day? Have you ever rehearsed what you would say to someone or how you're going to handle a difficult situation? Have you ever allowed discouraging thoughts to consume you? Have you ever ruminated or obsessed about a shortcoming or a mistake? A lot of times that's what happens with me in the night and I have to do that stop thing stop thought and meditate on him we need to practice shifting our focus to him shift our affection to god singleness of eye let's look at that scripture it's found in matthew 6 22. matthew 6 verse 22. i'm on page 7 of 10. that tells you we're getting closer Okay. Matthew 6, 22. What was it that Dutch Sheets said this morning? He said, um, praise and worship is so important for worshiping and so important for this time and, and worshiping longer and longer. So we're, we might be here longer and longer today. <laughs> praise God. Mm -hmm. Praise God. Hallelujah. Matthew 6, 22. So the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. 
And the King James version of that scripture says, if therefore your eye is single, if therefore your eye is single, your whole body will be full of light. Hallelujah. And we can gather that the meaning of the eye here is spiritual vision, what directs our path. Think of the initial definition of blessed, the one who walks a straight path. That was in the definition <coughs> of blessed. What we are focused on determines our path. And I would add our attitude and our perspective also determines our path. Perspective is key. We need God's perspective now more than ever. If we look on the world's, or we took on the world's perspective right now, we would be weighed down with fear and defeat but God. This goes for what's happening in our own natural lives, our nation, and the world. We also need his perspective on others. How does he see another person? How does he see me? What's his perspective on who I am? Because I can't afford to have a thought in my head about the state of affairs in the world. I can't afford to have a, a thought in my head about another person. I can't afford to have a thought in my head about myself that he doesn't have. That's right. How can I fulfill the plan and purpose he has for my life and damage the powers of darkness and engage in this end time battle if I'm stuck in my own head, if I'm paralyzed by fear, guilt, or shame, if anger, if I allow anger, resentment, bitterness, or jealousy to control my emotions, I need to have his perspective. I can't afford to not. And this is gained through closeness to him. And my sole focus needs to be on him day and night. And in everything I do, I acknowledge him so that he will direct my path. Amen. Some may say, is that, or ask, is that an even attainable? If it wasn't, it wouldn't be in here, right? That's right. Amen. And Jesus did it. Yes. And he's our example. Yes. Amen. The other part of that song that I mentioned earlier, and that was in the scripture that I read, that is so important, is the idea of clinging to him. Scripture says, cling to what is good. When we cling to something, what do you get a picture of? When I looked up the definition again, this was the first thing that popped up. To cling is to tightly grasp something like how wet clothes cling to the wearer. Clinging has to do with closeness. Fresh clothes out of the dryer often cling together. Hold fast is another word that's used in scripture to mean the same thing. Hallelujah. Let's turn to Deuteronomy 10. Deuteronomy 10, <clears throat> 20 and 21. You shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve him, and, and to him you shall hold fast, cling, and take oaths in his name. He is your praise and he is your God, who has done for you these great and awesome things which your eyes have seen. And in the helps it says, to hold you... To him you shall hold fast, indicates a very close and intimate relationship. The same verb is used for the relationship between, between a husband and wife. The Lord himself is to be the sole object of Israel's praise. The worship of God is a vital part of covenant requirements. Through worship, man gives an inward response and an outward expression of his relationship to God. Hallelujah. Now I'm going to go over to Joshua, which is just... The next book over, Joshua 23. And starting with verse 1. Now it came to pass a long time after the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their enemies round about that Joshua was old, advanced in age. And Joshua called for all Israel, for their elders, for their heads, for their judges, and for their officers, and said to them, I am old, advanced in age. You have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all those nations because of you, for the Lord your God is he who has fought for you. And if, if you look at Joshua's life, he clung to the Lord. He kept the Lord's con uh, concepts at the forefront of his mind at all times. And the Lord promised him in the beginning when he took, took reign, that he would do that for him, that he would be with him, and he would prosper him in whatever he did. 
And so he's, he's on his deathbed here. See, I have divided to you by, the, by law those nations that remain to be an inheritance for your tribes. From the Jordan with all the nations that I have cut off as far as the great sea westward. And the Lord your God will expel from them before you and drive them out of your sight. So you shall possess their land as the Lord your God promises you. Therefore, this is the important part, be very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, lest you turn aside it, turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left, and lest you go among these nations, these who remain among you, you shall not make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause anyone to swear by them. You shall not serve them, nor bow down to them, but you shall hold fast to the Lord your God as you have done to this day. Not looking to the left or the right. And I'm just going to turn over to the truth in action, which is just a couple pages over, if you have this Spirit of Life Bible. And look at number three. It says, as Israel took possession of their inheritance, they were continuously challenged to remain separated from the idolatry of those currently living in the land. That rings true today, doesn't it? Yeah. Continuously challenged to remain separated. As they held fast to the Lord, they remained wholly separated to him. And they were victorious as they, and they were victorious. As they compromised, they were defeated. That says it all, doesn't it? That says it all. Now just one more really good example I want to look at, and that's 2 Kings 18. So if you'll turn to 2 Kings, a few a couple chapters over. 2 Kings 18. I'm just going to read the first few scriptures there. Now it came to pass the third year of Hosea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king. And he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was, was Abby, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did, did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. He removed the high places and broke the sacred pillars, cut down the wooden image, and broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the children of Israel burned incense, incense to it and called it Nehushtan. Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor was there were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He clung to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. He had singleness of eye. The Lord was with him. He prospered wherever he went. Hallelujah. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Amen. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you men of double-minded. So this idea of seeing God, the bless of being pure in heart, is contingent on us drawing near to God. Our sole focus, singleness of vision, is on God. He promises to draw near to us. You can see from the scriptural examples that I just read that God showed himself true to his word and was with the people when they clung to him. They clearly saw his hand move to protect and prosper them. But when they turned away, that went away. As you can see, being pure in heart and seeing God go hand in hand. Remember that promise of being pure in heart. You will see God. They go hand in hand. Your soul, focus, and affection remains on God as you cling to him. He is there. You feel and see his presence in everything. John Piper lists three things that explain what it is to see God. One, to be admitted into his presence. He looks at the heart. He knows our heart. If it is pure and only seeking him, him we're admitted. He admits us into his presence. Simple as that. What's in our heart? Two, to be awestruck by his glory. 
that same God. Three, to be comforted by his grace. And I would add that to know Jesus is to see God. For he said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. He's the way to the Father, the only way. And it's also that seeing God is also gaining his perspective on everything as I touched upon earlier. Amen. I'm really close. I have one more scripture to read here. Go to Psalm 24. Psalm 24, starting in verse 1. The earth is the Lord and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And then the next scripture says this, or verse says, This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Selah. As I've mentioned over and over throughout this message, when we spend time with him, which takes an action on our part, right? Spend time with him. The more time we spend in his presence, the more our internal, our clean hands, that is our words, our actions, or our responses, where we go and what we do, how we handle situations, the example we live before men, the works for him will become pure. It's a natural byproduct of that closeness to him. And our internal, that's our heart, and if we go back to that original definition is the intellect, awareness, mind, inner person, feelings, deepest thoughts, yearnings, attitudes, will also become pure as we spend time with him. I want to close this message by reading today's excerpt from Oswald Chambers, my utmost for his highest. To my delight, today's devotional, September 6th, confirms my message. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Lover of my soul. Thank you. September 6th. The far-reaching rivers of life. He who believes in me, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. John 7, 38. A river reaches places which its source never knows. And Jesus said that if we have received his fullness, rivers of living water will flow out of his, us. So if we reach receive his fullness, rivers of living water will flow out of us, reaching in blessing even to the end of the earth. Regardless of how small the visible effects of our lives may appear to be, we have nothing to do with that outflow. This is the work of God, that you believe. God rarely allows a person to see how great a blessing he is to others. A river is victoriously persistent overcoming all barriers. For a while it goes steadily on its course, but when it comes to an obstacle, and for a while it is blocked, yet it soon makes a pathway around the obstacle, or a river will drop out of sight for miles, only later to emerge again even broader and greater than ever. Do you see God using the lives of others, but an obstacle has come into your life, and you do not seem to be of any use to God? Then keep paying attention to the source. Keep paying attention to the source. And God will either take you around the obstacle or remove it. Hallelujah. The river of the Spirit of God overcomes all obstacles. Never focus your eyes on the obstacle or the difficulty. Don't look to the left or right. Don't look at what's happening in the world, in the natural. The obstacle will be a matter of total indifference to the river that will flow steadily through you if you will simply remember to stay focused on the source. Amen. Never allow anything to come between you and Jesus Christ. Amen. Not emotion nor experience. Nothing must keep you from the one great sovereign source. Think of the healing and far-reaching rivers developing and nourishing themselves in our souls. God has been opening up wonderful truths to our minds and every point 
he has opened up is another indication of the wider power of the river that he will flow through us. If you believe in Jesus, you will find that God has developed and nourished in you mighty rushing rivers of blessings for others. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just thank you and praise you, Lord. Seal it to us, Lord. Seal it to us. As we just, you just place that desire in our hearts, that desire, that longing to want to be close to you, to turn our affections continuously to you so that you can move in and through us, so that those rivers can flow far and wide. And so you can just do such a work on the inside of us and the outside that we will affect change in the world around us. And we will complete the plan and purpose that you have for our lives. And we give you glory and honor and praise. For you are so worthy. We love you, Lord. We are blessed. Thank you, Lord. Amen.